So, my friend, I want to ask you, have you been listening to some of my podcasts for a while and identified for yourself all the areas that you feel your business could be better in? Maybe you just are so busy you haven't yet mastered the working as much as you like bit. (laughs) Or maybe you're just not bringing in the money, like you're struggling with the income, or it's just not enough. Well, it's time for us to have a conversation. In the show notes, there is a link to my evolution call. If you're a dance boss and you are ready to take action, let's have a chat and let's see where I can take you. Welcome, lovelies, to the Ultimate Dance Business Podcast. My name is Deborah Laws, the dance business expert. My passion is to help you turn your passion into profit while guiding you to work less and earn more. I'm super excited to share interviews with you that I know will inspire and motivate you in your schools, as well as my solo shows where I shall be sharing some great tips and strategies. So if you love the show, please do remember to review, subscribe and share it with your fellow dance boss friends. So let's get stuck into the business of dance. Hello, my loves. How are you all doing? I thought I would talk to you this month about the bigger picture. And what I mean by the bigger picture is what is it that you are actually striving to create for yourself in terms of your dance school? I know there are so many wonderful and lovely things that you are creating for your students and for anybody that comes into your school and experiences your school. So much of what we create is all about them, our customers, our clients, our students. But The other side, the flip side of that is what is it that you are creating for yourself? And I'm not talking about, you know, the the, the really big picture, you know, your why and your purpose in life and, um, you know, your legacy. I'm not quite going to that level today. I'm talking about what is the money that you generate from your school? What is the intention of that in terms of how you use that? Now, what I mean by this is freedom and choice. So I kind of think we could do a little bit of workshopping with this podcast today. I don't know if you're sat at home listening to this and you've got a pen and paper, or maybe you're out walking the dog, perhaps you're doing the washing, uh, driving to the studio. I'd love to know actually what you all do when you're listening to my podcast. But what I want to do is a little bit of a workshoppy type um, session today. So the first thing I would love you to write down for me is in an absolute ideal world, how many days, nights would I go out to teach or would I go to the studio? You know, in other words, in my kind of dream world, how much time would I have to myself with my friends and my family when I'm not involved in some way, shape or form with work, with my career, with my business, with my school. Now, maybe at the moment, your school is taking up six, maybe even seven days a week. um, And that just feels a, a bit too much for you. Maybe you're happy with that. Of course, if you're happy, great. This is what it's all about, having a happy life. But if you're not happy and you're working that many days, what would you initially love? Would you love to be able to guarantee that you never work a seven-day week? You've always got a certain day for the family. Or maybe you are currently working five days a week and you'd love to only work three days or three evenings. So how many more days or hours would you love to not be working in an ideal world? This is then going to make up part of your wish list, your dream bucket list for you in your school. And then I want you to also make a list of all the things that you are doing currently in your school in terms of classes that you teach, some of which I'm sure you absolutely love, some light you up, some energize you, some you can't wait to get in front of those students every week. 
but you might have a few where you kind of feel like if I could, I would give this class up. Maybe that's because you feel like it's not really your thing anymore. You've grown out of a class. Maybe you feel that you're, you know, a little bit too old. I've had this recently in my membership. Somebody brought this up. I feel too old to teach acro nowadays, or I feel like the kids would get a better experience. Somebody else took over my hip hop class. Like maybe it's an age thing and you feel like you've matured into, you know, different classes. Maybe it's a genre that you just don't love anymore. You know, I used to teach everything when I first left college, when I was first teaching, literally everything, ballet, modern tap, jazz, national, street dance competitions. Like in my twenties, I could, you could pretty much put me in front of anyone, but as my school developed and as I started to be able to have choices, there were certain classes that I no longer wished to teach anymore. My passion didn't lie there. Or maybe I just didn't feel I was the best person. You know, I taught ballet for many, many years, but I wasn't a strong classical dancer and I wasn't a strong classical teacher in terms of my demonstration. So although I knew I was a great teacher, I wasn't the best person to have in front of the kids. So when I was able to, I took ballet out of my curriculum and focused on the subjects that I could do and wanted to do. So look at your timetable of what you teach. And if not now, what in the future, what classes would you hand over? So we're working on our dream bucket list here. Okay, so we've got the amount of time we want to work and we've got the classes that we want to work. Now I want you to think about your school in terms of the admin tasks, the office tasks. Now, there will be certain things that you do because you're the only person that can do them. You're the only person that's around to do them. Maybe you can't afford anyone to pay anyone to do these tasks yet. And you do them, dare I say it, fairly incompetently. (laughs) In other words, we're not great at them. We never have been. We never will be. And we also don't like this task at all, but it's got to be done. So you just do it to the best of your ability. This is what I call your zone of incompetence. Like, gosh, like most people could do this better than me. Make a list of those tasks. And now make a list of what I call your zone of competence. These are things that are on your everyday list or your weekly list are the things in your school that you have to do that you are quite capable of doing. You are competent at these things. You do them to a an acceptable standard. It, they're not a problem for you. You don't dread them, maybe like you do the, the incompetence tasks, but you don't love them either. They're just things that have to, to be done. And you sit down and you're like, nah, energy. <laughs> So I want you to make a list of all of those things. And these might be things like, you know, chasing parents for their fees or um, creating social media posts. They might be things like your exam entries. You're quite competent. You just don't love it. It doesn't light you up. doesn't bring you lots of joy. And then I want you to make a third list. And these are things that we call your zone of excellence. Now, your zone of excellence are tasks that would be quite difficult for you to delegate, even if you could and you wanted to. They are things that you are really quite good at, like really good at, and you really enjoy. So these are things that you don't really want to necessarily get rid of because you love them and you're great at them. Make a list of those things. And then there's a fourth box. And our fourth box or our fourth list is your zone of genius. Your zone of genius is the ideal box that we want to spend our days and times in. And it's quite hard. It's like the holy grail getting into that box. I don't even spend all my time in my zone of genius. I'm still a little bit in my zone of excellence and sometimes even in my zone of competence. But your zone of genius are the things that you love. You are amazing at them you love it. It lights you up. If you could only do these things for the rest of your life, you would wake up happy every day. And, and this is the important thing, nobody else, nobody else on this planet can do these tasks. So I thought I would just share with you guys today the um, planners that I have produced for dance school owners because these are flying out of Amazon like 
hotcakes. And if you don't have yours yet, then all you have to do is pop to Amazon and type into the search Deborah Laws and all three books will come up. So the ultimate dance business planner I designed for you so that you had a little bit of a Deborah on your desktop. (laughs) The planners are full of business training, tips, motivational quotes, Uh, things to do at the start of the month, things to do at the end of the month, ways in which you can plan out your marketing and your retention. And they are selling all over the world. So go to Amazon, grab your number one best-selling ultimate dance business planner and enjoy mapping out the growth for your studio. These are the CEO tasks. These are the tasks not just the CEO tasks, the CEO tasks you love. And they're things that only the business owner can do. Only the visionary can really do. They're the things that steer the ship in the direction that you want it to go in. Okay, so you've got four lists or four boxes, depending on how you sat and done this. And so what I now want you to look at is if I had more income, if I had enough money that I could pay somebody to do the two tiers that would be amazing if they were taken off of your shoulders, which is the zone of incompetence and the zone of competence boxes. If you could pay someone to do all of those things, so you're only working in those two higher levels, oh my gosh, how happy would that make you? And and potentially, how much better would your school run? Because don't forget, something that's in your box of incompetence, for me, it would be accounting, bookkeeping, could be somebody else's zone of genius. So they do it with more passion, with more love, with way more expertise, probably way faster than you and way better than you. So what have you got that you would delegate away to skilled people that could work for you if you had the money to do so. All right. Are you still with me? Because we have now got our ideal number of days and hours that we would work, the ideal classes that we would love to teach. And now we've also got a list of the ideal jobs and tasks that we'd like to give away to somebody else. Okay. So our ideal school, how is it looking? Are we feeling quite good now? just doing the things you love in the office, doing the classes that you love teaching, spending the amount of time that you want to spend in your business. Ah, all we need now is some crashing waves (laughs) and a bright, hot, sunny day and a picnic and life would just be glorious. Okay, back to reality. So what I am trying to say to you is when we earn more money, when there is more money being generated in the business, for some people, it's about about, great. I can contribute more to the household expenses. Maybe this is going to help us upgrade our car. Maybe we can afford to have a second holiday. Maybe I can afford to have that designer handbag. Like when you earn more money and you're more successful in your school, it might be so that you can change your lifestyle, have nice things, like you just get to spend more, go out to eat a couple of times a month instead of once a term. So, you know, what it might be that having more money just improves your lifestyle. For some people, earning and generating more money in their school might mean that they can pay their bills and have a bit left over and relieve the stress and the worry that money can sometimes bring. For some people, earning more money, increasing the success of your school actually allows you to pay Teachers and teachers then afford you to have that time off that we looked at earlier. Maybe it means you can afford to pay someone to do your social media. Or maybe it's an administrator that's going to do some of those tasks, those incompetence and zone of competence tasks we talked about. Money doesn't have to buy you Jimmy Choo shoes. Money could buy you the freedom to make the choices that you'd like to make in your business. Money equals choice, which equals the freedom to do what you want, to teach what you want, to show up as you want. 
So, you know, very occasionally I have people that come and work with me and there's a little bit of kickback. I've even had someone, only one person in the last five years, but one person that said, I just feel like it's all about money. And I just wanted to put this message out really today. It's not always just about earning more and more and more. It's not all about money. It's about what the money brings. It brings the choices so that you can have the freedom. So when I'm working really hard on my business, I'm not thinking about, oh, and then I'll have some extra money every month. And how am I going to spend that? I'm thinking that extra money means I can up the hours of my VA which means I can stop doing that zone of competence task that I shouldn't be doing anymore, which means that I can step more into my zone of genius, which in turn is going to help me to get out there and help more people. So I want you to have a really clear idea. I want you to have a clear idea of when I earn an extra hundred pounds, how is that going to help me with my freedom and my choices? Or when I earn an extra 500 pounds a month, how am I going to invest that back into the business? so that I can have more choices and more freedom. This is what I want you to look at today in terms of what it is you're trying to create for yourself. Your ideal working pattern, your ideal income, your ideal what you get up and do every day. What's, let's work out the ideal first and then we'll work out the money that's needed to generate that. So then it kind of does all come back to the money. If you've decided that you want two nights off a week and that looks like £100 a week on additional teachers. Like work it out in terms of students. How many extra students do I need doing just one of my classes to pay for those teachers? And then out of those, how many extra students you need, then you need to create your plan on what am I going to do with my marketing and my attraction strategies to bring in those extra 10 students that I need to give me the money to pay for a teacher so I can have a night off so I get my choices. I always love to work it out in terms of student numbers because this makes sense to us, doesn't it? Like we can think to ourselves, oh, I need another five students and then I can do this thing. I need another 10 students and I can do this thing. It's a strategy that I use when I'm chatting to people on our initial call before they join my membership. You know, believe it or not, you only need five new students to join my Sparks membership. You need 10 new students that would pay for my middle tier, my Ignite program. And you only need 33 students, 33 new students to pay for a whole year working one-to-one with me in my Illuminate program. So when you put it like that in terms of numbers, you're able to kind of look back and go, oh, well, we had 30 new students last term. If I only need to get five more, which I know I obviously know how to do because we got 30 last that's not a big deal at all. Why am I worrying about the money? Let's let's just sign up now. (laughs) So do the same for you. How many students do you need to bring you in a certain income in order for you to invest it in a certain way to give you the money, freedom, and choices? All right, my loves, I hope that's been interesting for you today. I hope you did get a chance to sit down with a pen and paper and actually do this little workshoppy podcast, solo podcast with me this month. And I hope it's helped you to have a little bit more um, overview in terms of planning what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it currently. I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Do pop a comment into my Facebook group, Dance Business Lab Community, and just, you know, create a post and say, hey, Deborah, I've just listened to your podcast episode on freedom and choice. This is what I'm working towards. This is what I loved. I'd love to have some more feedback from you guys around the podcast and what you think. Anyway, take care and I will see you all really soon. So I wanted to tell you that this episode is kindly sponsored by Sally at Dance Studio Marketing, who is your go-to solution for growing your dance school through the power of social media. So if you're feeling overwhelmed at trying to attract new students, at Dance Studio Marketing, Sally helps dance studio owners just like you to leverage the power of social media and paid ads to bring in a steady stream of students, which of course helps you to achieve more balance in your life. So if you're ready to grow with less stress, 
visit sallyprendergast.com or you can connect with Sally at Dance Studio Marketing on your favorite social media platform today. My clients are getting fabulous results using Sally. So let's get those ads going and let's get your school growing. Welcome, lovelies, to the Ultimate Dance Business Podcast. My name is Deborah Laws, the dance business expert. My passion is to help you turn your passion into profit while guiding you to work less and earn more. I'm super excited to share interviews with you that I know will inspire and motivate you in your schools, as well as my solo shows where I shall be sharing some great tips and strategies. So if you love the show, please do remember to review, subscribe and share it with your fellow dance boss friends. So let's get stuck into the business of dance.